Russia recently lost the biggest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine. Could it mean the beginning of Putin's defeat? This bloody battle over the small coal mining town of Vuladar was part of the still ongoing struggle over the larger Donbass region. Vuladar lies about 40 miles southeast of the city of Donetsk, near the pre-invasion line which divided Ukraine from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And since the start of the year, Vuladar has become a killing field for Russian armor, with the largest tank battle of the entire war taking place there over the span of three weeks. In that time alone, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles, forcing Putin to rely on mass infantry assaults to try and retake the position. This was a serious blow, especially since tank warfare has been heavily mythologized in Russia since World War II and has also become symbolic of the broader conflict in Ukraine. And the Battle of Volodar showed yet again that the Russian military has some massive issues that won't be fixed anytime soon. Vuladar. Even the name itself has got a kind of Lord of the Rings dark and creepy ring to it, and with good reason. Here's why. While Vuladar has been the site of small clashes and shelling since the start of the invasion, the main battle for the town began on January 24, 2023. That night, Russia began launching assaults on Ukrainian positions, which would quickly turn into a devastating three-week siege demonstrating Russian failures. At that point, Ukraine was still waiting for sophisticated Western tanks, like the US Abrams and German Leopard 2, to arrive. Russia's replacement armor showed up earlier, but during its first deployment in Vuladar, it got absolutely decimated. Without superior firepower this time round, Ukrainians were forced to rely once again on strategy and tactics. Much of the three weeks took on the same pattern, pitched tank battles along dirt roads and tree lines, with Russians trying to thrust forward in columns and Ukrainians firing on them from hidden defensive positions. If this sounds familiar, it might be because Russia took the same terrible approach when trying to take Kyiv last year, costing them hundreds of tanks. Clearly, Russian commanders didn't learn much from that catastrophe and made exactly the same mistake this time around, advancing their unprotected tank columns into ambushes. So how did this latest embarrassment for Putin play out? Because the terrain around Vuladar is hard to defend, consisting mostly of flat, open plains and light woods, it is hardly ideal for stopping a major assault. But Ukrainians used the terrain to their advantage and applied doctrines of combined arms warfare, which Russian war planners clearly haven't picked up on. The key to Ukraine's victory in the Battle of Vuladar was in forcing Russia to fight on their terms. This meant limiting the battlefield and forcing Russian troops to attack where Ukraine wanted them to. To do so, the Ukrainian military placed hundreds of tanks and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside of Vuladar. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. But Ukrainian troops didn't just put mines everywhere. Instead, they left clear corridors between the minefields, only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. But rather than try an alternate approach to get around the mines, Russian commanders made one of the most basic mistakes in all of warfare, attacking exactly where their enemy wanted them to. When Russian commanders ordered their tanks into battle along these unmined paths outside Vuladar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same ambushes Ukrainians have employed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. The main tools Ukraine employed for this stage of the ambush were the domestically produced Stugna P and the American-made Javelin, both deadly anti-tank missiles, or ATGMs. Sometimes called the Skiff, the Stugna P is a less advanced system, but can still pack a serious punch against unlucky tanks. The Stugna is somewhat clunky, weighing about 60 pounds, and relies on manual guidance, requiring its operator to maintain line of sight on the target while the missile is still in flight. But even with these limitations, the Stugna has shown it can be deadly, with a range of up to 3 miles and tandem high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads 
capable of penetrating modern composite tank armor. The Javelin has proven to be even more successful at obliterating Russian tanks. Manufactured by American defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin has an effective range of more than 8,000 feet and employs a fire-and-forget targeting system, allowing its operator to flee to safety after firing. Once in flight, the Javelin's missile locks onto the infrared signature of its target and flies in one of two flight modes, top attack or direct attack. While its direct attack mode is similar to the Stugner, the Javelin's top attack mode has proven to be the most deadly against Russian tanks. In this configuration, the missile travels in a high arc, coming down on the top of the least protected section of the tank, just above its barrel. Like the Stugner, the Javelin also features a tandem warhead charge, using a smaller initial blast to penetrate hundreds of millimeters of armor, while the second charge creates a cone of superplastically deformed metal, which can shred the inside of a tank like paper. Both of these ATGM systems were put to good use outside of Vuladar. Among these responsible was Lieutenant Vladislav Bayek, the deputy commander of Ukraine's 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 72nd Brigade, which inflicted much of the damage on Russian armor. Working out of a bunker in Vuladar, Lieutenant Bayek used a drone to spot the first column of 15 Russian tanks and armored personnel vehicles. We were ready, he said. We knew something like this would happen. The Russian officers, meanwhile, clearly did not. Lieutenant Bayak waited until the tanks were strung out between the mined fields before ordering a lightning ambush with the command to battle. Stugner and Javelin operators hiding in the tree lines along the fields opened fire, as did hidden artillery positions further from the road, using American M777 and French Caesar howitzers. Each team was assigned a different section of the Russian column to fire on, focusing on the front and back vehicles first to create a bottleneck. The result was devastating. Tanks in the column attempted to turn and escape the ambush, only to blow up on the mine-laden shoulder of the road. In turn, each destroyed vehicle made it harder for the rest of the column to escape, with blown-up vehicles forming their own roadblock. At that point, Ukrainian artillery would open fire on the trapped tanks, killing the Russians who tried to flee from their trapped vehicles. It ended in obliteration. For three weeks, this pattern repeated itself with Russia losing more and more tanks and, incredibly, refusing to change tactics. At one point, Russian tanks became so stuck that Ukrainians were even able to call in a strike by a HIMARS rocket system, usually only effective against stationary targets like ammunition depots. Ukraine also made excellent use of its own older tanks as well. Because they couldn't outgun the Russian armor head-on, Ukrainians dug their tanks into hidden defensive positions. Some were concealed with bushes and camouflage netting, while others were actually buried in the soil, leaving only their turrets. While not effective against top-attack munitions, these dug-in defensive positions dramatically increased the survivability of Ukraine's tanks from head on fire. And because Ukrainians knew exactly where the Russian tank columns would advance, they were able to range the entire approach for their hidden tanks and artillery. This allowed them to make strikes onto predetermined firing points with high levels of accuracy and not waste their limited ammunition. During each ambush, Ukrainian tank crews also used a range of extremely clever tactics to problem-solve and avoid having their positions detected. The tanks couldn't wait with their engines turned on without giving themselves away through thermal signature or engine noise, but needed to stay warm to be quickly fired up for combat. So Ukrainians placed kerosene-burning heaters next to their engines to keep the tanks ready to go on a moment's notice. Similarly, their hidden positions meant that many Ukrainian tank crews did not have a line of sight to their targets, so they improvised by using drone operators to sight in their attacks. This also added an extra level of confusion for the already bewildered Russian forces, as their front lines were pummeled with unseen tank fire. Their own tanks couldn't locate where to return fire, leaving them essentially blind and helpless. If the Russian columns managed to escape the mines, ATGMs, artillery, and hidden tank positions, Ukraine just used drones to shift their firing positions to fleeing troops and vehicles. And for any tanks that actually managed to retreat back through the kill zone, Ukraine had yet another deadly surprise waiting. In one of its recent shipments of military aid, the United States supplied Ukraine with up to 10,000 specially modified 155mm artillery shells, each filled with nine individual anti-tank mines and a magnetic detonator. Known as Remote Anti-Armor Mine Systems, or RAMs, 
These terrifying weapons were used to mop up any surviving Russian tanks. When a fleeing column would exit the rear of the kill zone, another group of hidden Ukrainian gunners opened fire on their rear, once again trapping them with a rain of anti-tank mines. By employing this strategy again and again against Russians who refused to try other approaches, you can see how Ukrainian defenders destroyed over 100 tanks and armored vehicles in a matter of weeks around Volodar. After a few successful ambushes, it also became clear to Ukrainian commanders that the Russians are running out of experienced tank crews and commanders alike. One Russian tank commander captured outside of Volodar turned out to be a medic who had been given a brief crash course and then sent to the front lines. Because successfully operating even an older tank takes several months of specialized training, there was little chance that the former medic would do anything but get himself killed or captured. And this wasn't a one-off, but a repeating pattern, with almost every Russian officer captured near Volodar having little to no experience in battle. And incredibly, the tank crews these officers were commanding appeared to be even greener. Most were made up of recent conscripts who had, at best, a passing familiarity with whatever vehicle they were operating. This astonishing lack of qualified personnel, while far from surprising, is yet another sign that the Russian war effort is falling apart. Russia lost nearly all of its experienced tank crews during the spring of 2022, during the disastrous assault on Kyiv. The limited number who survived those early ambushes were sent back to the east of the country as Putin limited his war effort. But those survivors were once again decimated during the wildly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive last fall. During that period, the most elite of Russia's remaining tank units, the First Guards Tank Army, was nearly destroyed outside the northern city of Liman. This was the best trained and equipped Russian tank force operating in Ukraine and was supposed to easily hold captured territory. Considering that even this elite unit was not up to the task, it's no surprise that the green Russian troops sent to Volodar have fared so badly. This is a sharp contrast with Ukrainian forces, many of whom were green and terrified when they were drafted or volunteered to defend their country last February. Even though many of those defending Volodar were relatively recent recruits, they learned on the go and didn't make the same mistake twice. Most of Ukraine's most experienced tank crews are currently elsewhere in Eastern Europe, learning to operate the advanced Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks. Yet even the relatively untested troops defending Volodar were able to pull off another staggering victory. This is a pretty clear indication that the war has decisively turned in Ukraine's favor, both in terms of equipment and personnel. It's also yet another reminder of just how poor Russian military doctrine and planning is turning out to be, as neither field officers nor top military brass seem able to learn from past mistakes. Part of this difficulty likely comes from the very structure of the Russian military, which is made up of multiple, independently commanded parts. This lack of a unified command structure has plagued Russia for years and appears to be at least part of the reason why new conscripts are not warned against walking into obvious ambushes. Similarly, the seasoned troops which should theoretically be spearheading such an assault appear to be in much worse shape than expected. A recent intelligence report from the UK found that Russia sent another elite unit, the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, into the fighting around Volodar. This force is supposed to be among the deadliest in Russia and was utilized in the largest battles last year. But the 155th suffered so many losses that even before Volodar, it was on its third personnel restaffing since the start of the war. As a result, this supposedly first-class fighting force is now staffed mostly by fresh recruits. Adding to the dysfunction is the fact that the 155th was apparently not being sent into combat together, but instead broken up into smaller units and integrated with other commands. Rather than the desired effect of boosting other units' battle readiness, the decision simply made the 155th entirely ineffective. It certainly doesn't help that Russia is rapidly running out of precision-guided munitions and other war supplies. As a result, Russian forces were unable to eliminate the Ukrainian artillery and ATGM positions before their assault on Volodar, assuming they could force their way into the town regardless. Another reason behind Russia's repeated failures in Volodar and elsewhere relates to its heavy use of private military contractors, or PMCs. The most notorious of these is the Wagner Group, headed by Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin's reliance on Wagner and other groups, as well as the rampant corruption in Russia, has led to a scenario where each is directly competing for the spoils of war. Volodar is near two massive coal mines, 
one of the main reasons why Russia has spent so much time and blood trying to take the town. But since its resources would only likely be given to one PMC, there is a strong incentive to fight over spoils. So at Vuladar, the official Russian military, the Wagner Group, and the Patriot PMC, controlled directly by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, have all been competing to make the town their own. As a consequence, none of these groups shared information over the potential ambushes, each hoping that the other would take most of the casualties, leaving them free to take over and plunder the town. Controlling the near 70 million tons of coal underneath Vuladar would make either Prigazin or Shoigu far wealthier than they currently are giving them a billion-dollar reason not to cooperate. Of course, this dynamic isn't great for an effective fighting force, and has left Russia at a significant information disadvantage. There's another political dimension to Russia's failure in Vuladar as well. It's clear to pretty much everyone but the Russians that the smart move would have been to move elsewhere and avoid the potential of mines and ambushes. Yet Russian commanders have insisted on bizarre pitched assaults, possibly because of Putin's desperate need for a political win. Anywhere Russian forces have been ground to a halt, the political importance of not appearing to lose a battle has come to outweigh the strategic importance of withdrawing and maneuvering around static defenses. Doing so would be yet another signal of weakness, especially to Putin's most hardline supporters of the invasion. But even so, after the staggering loss at Vuladar, cracks are starting to show. Russian military bloggers a vocally pro-war group have fiercely criticized the endless failed tank assaults. Grey Zone, a telegram channel close to the Wagner Group, posted in early March that relatives of the dead are inclined almost to murder and blood revenge against the general who was in charge at Vuladar. And while the Ukrainian armed forces can be glad of Russia's staggering incompetence, we should never forget the terrible price paid by places like Vuladar. By the end of the Russian assault in February, the town's deputy mayor stated that Vuladar was destroyed, with 100% of the buildings damaged. Of the town's original population of 15,000, less than 500 remain, mostly squatting in ruins and collecting rainwater to drink. While there is no doubt that the battle was a tactical victory for Ukraine, it will also take many, many years before anything can be rebuilt. In any case, it is more than clear that the war's trajectory has changed in Ukraine's favor, and that Russia cannot suffer too many more defeats like this one. But what do you think? Was Vuladar a turning point in the war? And will Russia's repeated failures eventually doom Putin's ambitions? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.